Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and, and welcome. My name is Associate Professor Peter Van Weingarten. I'm Deputy Director at the Centre for Eye Research Australia, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our first community forum of 2021. I know that many of you will be looking forward to attending events in person again, and we do plan to be able to offer in-person events later in the year. It is, however, wonderful to see so many of you embracing events in their digital format. Uh, and that's especially important because it gives our interstate and overseas supporters the opportunity to join in. So welcome. Before we uh, commence our presentations today, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Bunwarung people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to you from. And I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So now on to some general housekeeping matters. We are encouraging you to ask questions today and you can do this by typing any questions that you might have in the box that you should see at the bottom of your screen or via the comments section if you're watching us via Facebook. I'd like to uh, extend a big thank you to those of you that have already sent your questions through for today. We'll try to get on to as many of the questions as we can at the end of the presentations. But if we don't manage to address your question today, we'll endeavor to follow up with you offline. Um, I, I would hazard um, to say that we can't provide specific medical advice during the session. Um, and we encourage you to consult your eye health care provider if you have any specific concerns. So we're here today to hear presentations about eye health and age-related eye disease. Vision is, of course, one of our most important senses, and it's integral to so many aspects of our lives and the, the way in which we interact with the world. As we get older, the risk of developing eye conditions that can lead to vision loss increases. Now, at the Centre for Eye Research Australia, our mission is to eliminate the major eye diseases that cause vision loss and blindness and to reduce their impact on people's lives. Today, we've come together to provide you with information on some of the common conditions to look out for as you get older, age-related macular degeneration, cataracts, and diabetic eye disease. Glaucoma is, of course, another common disease that can affect us as we get older, but we're not going to focus on glaucoma today. If you're interested in hearing more about glaucoma, I encourage you to visit the Zira Facebook page where you can watch videos on glaucoma from experts such as Professor Keith Martin and Dr. Flora Hui, who presented on the condition earlier this year during World Glaucoma Week. There are other very useful resources about glaucoma on the Zira website. So today I'm joined by a stellar lineup of eye health experts. Professor Robin Geimer will speak to us about age-related macular degeneration and Dr. Jacqueline Belts, corneal and cataract surgery expert, will be talking to us about cataracts. So with no further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Robin Geimer to the forum. Robin is a Deputy Director of CIRA, the Head of the Macular Research Unit and Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne. She's also a senior retinal specialist at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. Robin's been recognised for her significant service to ophthalmology and in particular as a clinician and researcher devoted to age-related macular degeneration. Accordingly, she was named a member in the general division in the 2018 Queen's Birthday Honours list. Robin's current work centres on the investigation of new strategies for treating the early stages of age-related macular degeneration and identifying ways to improve clinical trials for the disease. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you, Robin. I guess it's a pity um, that... Um, we can't uh, share a cup of tea together as we usually do at this forum, but uh, thank you for all negotiating the technology to get on to listen to us today. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, my favourite topic, which is age-related macular degeneration or AMD. So just so we start uh, with a common knowledge, um, if you think of your retina as the film in the camera, uh, the picture, for those that can see the picture on the, the left, is what a normal retina would look like, uh, and that's targeting the central part of the retina called the macula. 
And with age, we get these deposits called drusen uh, and these sort of clumps of pigment sitting right where your very fine uh, vision uh, is um, taken from, and that is what begins to, to become age-related macular degeneration. And you will have heard talks before, and you'll, if you're interested in this disease, you'll know that there are big advances in the treatment of what's called the wet form of AMD, which is one of the late forms of AMD. In the past, we've talked about all the uh, revolution in treatments, which are now given as injections into the back of the eye. And really, there's a couple of treatments, but they all work very similarly, and they aim to stop the bleeding at the back of the eye, destroying the vision, as you can see on the picture here. Without treatment, you get this large scar. There's still a lot of research trying to perfect these treatments, trying to get longer acting drugs so that people don't need to have these injections so frequently, or trying to work out a, a different way to deliver the drugs so you don't need to have these injections, which are somewhat um, not so pleasant. Um, but also we recognize that even with such dramatic advances in, in preventing severe vision loss, people do still go on to lose vision slowly over time in a, in a large majority of cases. So now the work is trying to make sure that the benefits that we got from these treatments last into the medium and long term. So uh, over the past three years, because we do notice that people do go on and lose vision either from just cells dying or some scarring. So what I'm going to talk about mainly today is this other form of late AMD called geographic atrophy. It's called geographic atrophy because the little moth-eaten holes that develop in the macula used to be thought of as being like a, a map uh, or the outline of a country. And so that's where the term geographic atrophy came from. But we often call this dry macular degeneration. And currently there are no treatments proven to slow down the growth of these holes. So you can see here, uh, I've tried to show a picture where there's sort of a half a, half a semicircle worth of uh, moth-eaten holes. And then it, if nothing is done, those holes tend to, to join up and then you get this large patch of missing retina. So there's no, nothing that we have currently that we know either stops this from happening or slows down the progression. But there has been some work, and at the moment, uh, uh, some of those the big large trials have been rather disappointing in their outcomes and has resulted in no currently approved treatment. We, um, as Peter said in the introduction, we try to work to stop people getting there in the first place. So what could we do to stop people who have the earliest signs of the disease going to either the wet form or the dry form of late AMD? And so we see that the real urgent unmet need is trying to find a preventative strategy once you've identified about one in seven people over 50 that have the early signs of the disease, how do you progress, how do you stop them progressing? And I want to show this picture just to give those that have the vision, good enough vision to see the slides, uh, that uh, this is um, the best way to image these, what I call these moth-eaten holes, um, in which I think you would agree that's what they look like. And so these are two patients where over each year they've had a photograph, uh, uh, what's called an autofluorescent image. And hopefully you can see these grey or black uh, areas that are just missing retina. Fortunately, in many cases, they, they don't start in the dead centre. And so the very fine vision is still okay, even though there are quite large patches surrounding central vision. So often you'll have trouble reading, yet being able to read the doctor's eye chart is not too difficult. Not everybody uh, progresses in terms of their growth of their holes the same as each other. And so people are divided into what's called rapid progressors or slowly progressing cases. And you can see on the top uh, graph there um, is that the, what is what I would call a fast uh, progressing case where over each year, hopefully you can see that those black areas just uh, continue to expand and coalesce and join up. Whereas the bottom image uh, is of a case which really hasn't changed a lot over the three years of follow-up. Having said that, however, um, the first case, the, the very centre is spared or it's called foveal sparing. So vision is still probably 6'6 six, six or normal. Uh, whereas in the bottom one, even though the progression is slow, 
unfortunately, that moth-eaten hole has started in the middle, and so vision may well be, be down at this stage. So this picture, I don't expect anyone to read the blue boxes, but it's really to show the enormous amount of activity that's currently underway um, uh, in trying to find a treatment for this disease. So some of these uh, treatments are based on what's called cell therapy. So that's getting a variety of different stem cells uh, generated in different ways and trying to place these stem cells in the retina or under the retina to replace the missing cells. The vast majority of these blue boxes, though, belong to what's called uh, the complement pathway. And so trying to intervene in this pathway, which is responsible for causing uh, inflammation in the retina. And that is thought to be a big driver of the progression of these holes. And so much of the activity you can see is in that middle box, trying to stop uh, this uh, inflammatory focus. And then there are some other uh, strategies that are being trialled as well. Most of the treatments, unfortunately, have to be given with these injections into the eye, similar to wet AMD. However, there are some uh, strategies where the injection is actually given what's called subcutaneously or just under the skin. And then some treatments actually require uh, surgery on the retina, which is uh, potentially the cell-based therapy and gene-based therapies. So I just want to just dwell a little bit on this inflammatory pathway or what's called the complement pathway. And this uh, diagram shows the very many places that we're trying to intervene. And the red circles show um, trials that are currently underway in Australia and indeed at the Centre for Eye Research Australia. So this pathway called the complement pathway is basically involved in protecting us from harm. So it gets activated from when there is a, an infection or uh, some, something that we need to mount an inflammatory response. And we know it's important in AMD because of a lot of work looking at genes. So many of you may have been involved in some of our gene uh, collecting studies where we look to find the genes that are associated with disease. And many of those have been implicated, implicate this pathway. And also those deposits that I showed in that first photo, those drusen, we know that they activate this pathway. And so many therapies are trying to dampen down this activity. You would think it's a good idea to have this response, but indeed in the retina, it's not such a good idea. And the bright cross cross is on a, 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 a drug that was trialed very early a few years ago, very large, what are called phase three studies, min, many millions of dollars spent thinking that this would be a good target blocking one of these pathways. And unfortunately, these trials were halted early. We were part of these trials because it was not showing to be very beneficial. However, more recently, there's been a little bit more success. So this is just one study called the Philly study. And uh, you can see uh, in one of those red boxes with the little asterisk, this is the, uh, the drug we're looking at. And what we're supposed to see in this um, uh, graph here is the gray line is what happens if you don't intervene at all. This, this is the rate of growth of these holes over time. And hopefully you can see that that rate has dropped a little uh, with uh, an injection in the eye either every month or every other month of a drug that's targeting a different part of this pathway. And so whilst you might think, think that this is, doesn't look that encouraging, it actually uh, is better than, than no treatment. And so if we could slow down the growth of these holes by 20 to 29%, which this graph shows, it may well be that we can save central vision for some years. And this is uh, another trial that's also looking quite uh, promising where they're just act, um, targeting a slightly different uh, molecule in that pathway. And you can hopefully see a very similar result that there does seem to be just a slowing down of the growth. So the, the holes do get bigger, but uh, at a slower weight rate than if you were not treating. So just finally then, um, uh, on, on talking about these interventions, it's a big question that uh, we really haven't solved yet is who will we treat if there is a treatment that's approved, like one of these two that are, I've just uh, described, um, and will the treatment be forever? So uh, given that it's potentially going to be an injection in, your, in an eye for perhaps every month or every other month, would we really treat 
everybody with the very beginnings of this or would we just aim for those where the growth rate has been shown to be very quick or perhaps when it starts to threaten the fovea or that very central vision? When, when would we start to intervene and what, um, you know, the payers, what, what will they be happy to pay for? And potentially if we are talking about an injection in an eye with all the risks and the burdens of turning up, um, maybe we would just elect to treat perhaps the second eye um, that after uh, the first one had perhaps been, been left untreated. And what we are trying to do is try to go a little earlier. So perhaps even if the trials require larger patches of these moth-eaten holes to get into the trials to, to, to run their studies, perhaps when they're available, would you actually start earlier? And maybe you can see in this uh, uh, red square in that middle picture down the bottom, the very beginnings of a little dark patch. So ideally, you'd like to try uh, to intervene here. This is what's called intermediate AMD. It is not late AMD, but there's just that beginning that on the scan, you can see what's called nascent geographic atrophy or the beginnings or, of, of uh, geographic atrophy. So perhaps we would like to move earlier. And then I just want to move on to what we're currently doing uh, and concentrating on quite a lot is trying to slow the progression of, of that disease. So wouldn't it be better if we could stop people progressing to even the beginning of the dry or indeed the wet AMD? And uh, those that have attended these talks before will have heard us uh, present on our laser study. Uh, this is where we try to find people at great risk of progressing and then use what's called a sub-threshold nanosecond laser. So that's a laser that is very rapid, um, nanoseconds worth of uh, a pulse. And the idea is that that does not have time to damage any of the retina surrounding the cells that we're targeting. And we've used this laser for many years now. It's an Australian-made laser. And we ran a very large study over three years with over 300 people in it uh, to, to see how uh, it uh, whether we could slow down the progression. And we finished that study in 2018. And what we found in that study was overall made no difference despite a lot of effort and work and planning. If you took the whole group of people in the study uh, and followed how many of them developed late AMD over time, you can see that there's really not a lot of difference between those two graphs. However, not all bad news. During the time we were running that uh, study, it became clear that there were different groups of people with AMD. You couldn't just lump everybody into the same intermediate AMD class. And there were people that had typical drusen, uh, which is shown there in the orangey color. And then there were a group of people that had funny looking drusen that were called pseudo drusen. And because they were distributed in like a net like pattern, they had this reticular pattern. So they're called reticular pseudo drusen. And they are recognised as being very different and potentially a, a higher risk group. And they actually influenced a, a, a layer of cells that actually we were targeting with the laser. And so we wondered whether or not if you divided the group into those with or without those high risk drusen, and whether you would have a difference. And we very nicely showed that in the typical drusen people, which about 75% of people with AMD, in the red line on the top, you can hopefully see that there's really not much uh, progression uh, over time. So the graph, every time someone gets um, uh, late AMD, the, the, the graph goes up. And so those without the high-risk characteristics did very well with the treatment. But the bottom graph shows that those with this high-risk uh, characteristic uh, actually did, did probably worse uh, with the treatment. And this is just showing those people that can have uh, fine, good central vision that can see this, uh, uh, an example of perhaps what you'd call a, a good result. This is a person with typical drusen uh, along the top before treatment and those that picture with the green and red dots shows you how well the retina uh, sees in all those different spots the patient has had to push the button when they can see a light and the green dots are, are normal and the orange and red are poorly responding dots. And after the laser treatment, which was really only 12 spots um, scattered um, under the blood vessel layer in that macula, hopefully you can see a lot of those drusen disappeared and the function in the retina improved quite nicely. So all those spots were, were green. However, an eye that had reticular pseudodrusen is represented here. And even before we started, 
hopefully you can see those dots aren't green. They're all, all very poorly functioning retina. Even though the vision is fine, um, they just don't, they're much sicker eye. And hopefully you can see after my laser, the, what we were talking about before, these moth-eaten holes or the geographic atrophy really marched on uh, despite or, or, in fact, because of the treatment that uh, we administered. And what's new uh, this year is we actually followed people for five years. So the study was only a, a three-year study, but we uh, followed uh, a vast majority of them at our site and one other for five years. And what's interesting is that the results are very similar. So we did not treat people after three years, but you can see overall there was no difference after five years. But if we have a look again at those uh, different uh, classes of AMD, even though we stopped treatment at three years, at five years we were still seeing a benefit in those people that did not have that high risk. So the vast majority of people, 75% of the group, showed a, quite a good benefit uh, lasting out to five years um, with the laser. And in, indeed, those in that high risk group that probably were too far gone for us to be able to protect with this treatment continue to do quite badly. And so finally then uh, the conclusion of our study was that uh, it was safe, it did not cause problems, uh, which uh, in the past laser studies have done in terms of causing uh, late AMD. And in those people with drusen, overall there was no difference. But if you do separate them into those two different categories of, of AMD, one group, the vast majority of people with early and intermediate AMD did well, but there was clearly a group that potentially uh, it is, is not the treatment to use. And the five-year extension study um, confirmed those results. And so what clearly we need to do now is repeat this study, which we're working to do in America uh, and internationally to confirm those results, the promising results in those people without that high risk. So I'd like to thank my team, the macular research team, which is now 24 years uh, old. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robin. That was uh, really uh, an, a very clear presentation um, that, that gave us all a sense that we're really advancing a long way in our understanding of age-related macular degeneration. And, and importantly, that uh, it's not one disease. It's, it's a, a much more nuanced than we previously thought. And I have to say that Robin's group is amongst the world leading groups in, in helping us uh, to understand uh, the disease. So it's now my uh, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jacqueline Belts. Uh, Jackie holds a research position at CIRA and she's a staff specialist on the corneal unit at the Royal Victorian Eye India Hospital. And importantly, she's the deputy medical director of the Lions Eye Donation Service in Melbourne. So she provides a, a corneal and cataract service uh, with a particular emphasis on corneal transplantation. But today, Jackie's gonna be talking to us about cataract and the ageing eye. So over to you, Jackie. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me at this wonderful presentation. And thank you to all of you out there virtually. It's a pleasure to be here to speak with you today. Thank you so much for coming. So I would also like to talk about one of my favourite topics, which is cataract. And this is extremely important when we're thinking about the ageing eye. None of my financial disclosures are relevant for this presentation. So everybody listening today will know somebody with a history of cataract. Cataract's so common, but what is cataract? Why do cataracts occur? How do we treat them? What are the options? And if we do have treatment, what's recovery like? So these are all questions that come up when we talk about cataracts and things that I'd like to discuss today. Inside our eyes, we have a natural lens the lens focuses light that comes into the eye to help us to see. Ideally, the lens should be clear like the top lens in this in illustration. A cataract is when your eye's natural lens becomes cloudy like the bottom lens shown here. Usually as we age, our lens gets thicker, but also proteins in our lens break down and cause this yellowing of the lens that causes our vision to be blurry, hazy or less colourful when we have cataracts. Having cataracts can be described as looking through foggy or dirty windshields quite often. Whilst cataracts are highly and effectively treatable with surgery, they remain by far the most common cause of blindness in the world. In most parts of Australia, we have excellent access to cataract surgery. 
We have about 250,000 hospitalizations for cataract surgery in Australia per year, making this one of the most common operations. Unfortunately, the prevalence of vision loss from un unoperated cataract is much higher for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, and improving access to cataract surgery is one of the foci of closing the gap programs relating to Indigenous eye health. Access to cataract surgery and waiting times for cataract surgery for all groups of patients does vary state to state, but treatment for cataracts is mostly quite accessible in Australian communities. So what are the symptoms of cataract? Well, this is my daughter, but not my dog. If anybody listening has low vision, this slide shows a dog with easily visible white cataracts on the top. And below that is an image of my six-year-old daughter, Betsy, smiling for the camera. In one image, colours are bright and vibrant, but in the other, other image, colours are dull and yellow. It's rare, at least in our populations, to have cataracts that are easily visible to others, such as this dog has. Much more commonly, cataracts cannot be seen without magnification or special equipment. People with cataracts might experience any of the symptoms listed here, with the most common being blurry vision, reduced quality of vision and seeing bright colours as faded or yellow, as I've tried to recreate in the image of Betsy. So what causes cataract? Well, ageing is by far the most common cause. Starting from when we're young, the lens becomes thicker and thicker, and also the normal proteins in our lens start to break down. Eventually, those proteins become disorganised, and this leads to cloudiness of our vision. We will all develop some form of cataract. It's an absolutely normal part of ageing. And at least so far, we don't have a way to stop that process. People over the age of 60 would usually have some visible clouding of their lenses. However, this might be completely without symptoms. Vision problems develop at different times for everybody and depend on things like how cloudy or clear the lens is, whereabouts in the lens the cloudiness is, and what the person's visual requirements are. Most age-related cataracts develop slowly. Certain forms of cataract can develop more quickly, but the rate of progression usually is quite slow, which can often make it difficult for the person experiencing the cataract to notice the changes. Whilst cataracts are a normal part of ageing and progression usually does occur, protecting your eyes from ultraviolet light might help to slow down progression. Quitting smoking is a great way to prevent visual loss from cataract and also many other causes. And taking care of other medical conditions, especially diabetes, makes a very big difference. So how do we diagnose cataracts? Well, your optometrist or ophthalmologist will examine and test your eyes to make the diagnosis. This eye examination will include dilating your pupils, so be prepared for a couple of hours of blurry vision after you have that done. I recommend adults over the age of 40 have an eye check once per year, and in Australia this would most commonly be done at an optometrist. Once you or your optometrist notice a problem, in this case cataract, referral might be made to see an ophthalmologist. Your ophthalmologist will examine all parts of your eye under magnification with special equipment, which helps us to see the abnormalities. We'll ask you a series of questions about your symptoms, the quality of your vision and your visual requirements. Vision and eye health will also be measured using eye charts and other special technologies. Once symptoms and signs are affecting your quality of vision and quality of life, that's when we consider treatment for cataracts. So how do we treat cataracts? Well, cataracts can be removed only with surgery. If your cataracts are either not causing symptoms or the symptoms are not bothering you very much, you don't have to have them removed. You might be able to manage or sometimes a new glasses prescription might help you enough to be able to at least delay surgery. You should consider cataract surgery when the cataracts start to affect your quality of life or when they stop you from doing things that you want to or need to do. Cataract surgery is one of the most frequently performed and safest operations in the world. During cataract surgery, your surgeon will remove your eye's natural lens, which has become cloudy, and replace it with a nice, clear artificial lens. The new lens is called an intraocular lens, or IOL, 
And when you decide to have cataract surgery, your doctor will talk to you about IOLs, how they work, all of the different options that we have these days, and which one or ones might be considered for your eyes and your lifestyle. Cataract surgery is usually done one eye at a time as a day surgery under local anaesthetic, which means that you'll be awake, but you won't be able to feel or see your surgery taking place. Apart from improved safety of cataract surgery and a massive reduction in recovery time, one of the greatest advan advances over the last 10 years or so has been our ability to reduce a patient's dependency on spectacles after cataract surgery. When we choose the IOL or lens to put in your eye, we use measurements and mathematics to estimate the best IOL for your eye. We've literally gone from me memorizing a formula and calculating a lens on my calculator to formulae consisting of up to 3,000 lines of code. As technologies have improved, not only in relation to mathematics, but also in terms of measurements and IOL technology, we've been able to achieve better and better results. However, we still don't have the perfect IOL solution. The three most important distances in terms of visual function would be distance such as driving or looking at the TV, intermediate, these days super important as we all need our computers, tablets and phones, and near, such as reading menus or newspapers, things like that. Most commonly, an IOL that we put in at the time of cataract surgery would only provide visual correction for one distance and it cannot adjust for different distances. As distance vision is so important for us and our mobility and safety, this is often but not always prioritised as the most critical distance. Today, most of the time, we would at least aim to reduce a patient's dependency on distance glasses following cataract surgery. It's a really great opportunity to do that. Near and intermediate vision is more complicated, but becoming more and more important as our lifestyles depend more and more on reading and technology. Most patients after cataract surgery would need to wear glasses for intermediate and near vision. Much research and development has been focusing on IOL technologies to reduce dependency on glasses across all of these three important distances. Whilst we do have many excellent options, such as trifocal intraocular lenses and extended depth of focus intraocular lenses, all aimed at reducing dependency on glasses for near tasks, it's really important to discuss the pros and cons of each choice carefully with your surgeon, as they do come with some risks or side effects and they're not suitable for all eyes. In general, it's really important that the one intraocular lens lasts you for a lifetime. As I mentioned previously, cataract surgery is most commonly done as a day procedure, which means you can go home on the same day under local anaesthetic, which means you're awake during surgery. And most commonly we do one eye at a time. Surgery is done in an operating theatre, either at a hospital or at a day surgery facility. And as long as you have somebody to take care of you that night, it is okay to go home on the same day as cataract surgery. You'll be advised of your fasting instructions. Usually that's about six hours before surgery. On arrival, you'll be checked in. Your pupil will be dilated with eye drops so that the surgeon will have good access to your lens. You'll have a local anaesthetic, either by eye drops again or by using an injection to numb your eye. And then you'll go into surgery where you'll stay awake, but whilst you might be able to see light or shadows or colours, you'll not see the surgery taking place or any of the instruments. The surgeon will make two or three small cuts or incisions into the side of your eye, through which he or she will carefully remove your natural lens and insert the artificial lens. The incisions are usually self-sealing, but sometimes we need to put a little stitch that will later be removed. You'll rest in recovery for about half an hour before being ready to go home. After cataract surgery, you'll have some eye drops to take with specific instructions. You'll also receive instructions on how to take care of your eye and what sort of activities to avoid over the first week or two. In general, visual recovery is very fast, Although you might not reach full final vision for six weeks, in general, recovery is much faster than that. And most people are back to almost full activities by a week after surgery. Whilst the risk of cataract surgery is extremely low, we usually quote a success rate in the vicinity of about 98%. 
The eye is very delicate and any surgical decision should always include discussion and consideration of not only the expected benefits, but also any possible risks. Your surgeon will discuss your particular level of risk with you at the time of your surgical decision making. In general, the risk of cataract surgery is normally much lower than the expected benefits. However, in the setting of early cataract, when the cataracts are not yet really affecting you or your quality of life, even this small risk might be unnecessary to take. Now, one thing I'd love to talk to you about is how we learn cataract surgery, as this is a special interest of mine. And um, first, we need to undertake ophthalmology training. So ophthalmology training, like all medical specialties, is a long road. We do medical school. For me, that was six years at the University of Tasmania. I'm from Tassie. After that, we need to do at least three years of residency, which is looking working at a hospital across a range of different areas. And, and I did that at both the Royal Hobart Hospital and the Austin Hospital in Melbourne. After that, we do specialty training, which is five years. And I did mine at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, where I still work today. As the last year of that training, and then optionally after that, we can undertake further study or training in what we call subspecialty or very particular areas. For me, I did two years of extra training to be a corneal transplant surgeon. One of those years was in Melbourne at the Eye India Hospital, and the other one was in Italy at this beautiful hospital shown on the bottom right, which is called Villa Igea Hospital in Forli, Italy. It's during the five years of ophthalmology training that we start to learn and then perform eye surgery. I'm in charge of that training in Victoria, and I'm very passionate about training our young surgeons to be not only good, safe surgeons, but excellent surgeons that are ready to innovate, progress our field, and really contribute to improving eyesight around the world. It certainly is a privilege to operate on people's eyes. Eyes are so delicate and important, and I'd love you to see how seriously we take the training um, in this area. So... What we've worked on in Victoria is a program that involves structured lab training. We do wet, dry and virtual reality simulation. Since 2019, we've had a, also had a structured training program run together with sports psychologists where we train the mind skills required to be an excellent surgeon. As you can imagine, there's a very specific skill required in terms of focus, ability to stay calm, etc., we encourage learning from each other as we go through our whole careers and we go back to refreshing skills and learning new skills all the time and every year. We also, of course, have plans for further improving our training program over the next few years. Now, the next slide does show a little bit of eye surgery. So if you'd prefer not to see that video, just look away. But of course, we do love technology in ophthalmology and virtual reality cataract surgery simulation has been an amazing tool for us to incorporate into our training program. Now, no simulation model is going to be the same as the real thing. In fact, we don't even need it to be. That's not even the point. The point is that we can learn from simulation so that we're better when we're doing the real thing. As you can see here, though, the equipment is very realistic. So on the left here, you can see a surgeon practicing in virtual reality, one of the steps of cataract surgery. And on the right, you can see the real surgery taking place. You can see that a lot of the features of the simulation model are very realistic. So what does the future have in store for us in terms of cataract? Well, Prevention is always better than treatment. At this stage, diet, lifestyle and UV protection are probably the most important factors, as well as seeking regular eye checks. A safe and effective topical treatment for preventing cataracts would be the holy grail. Research in that field does include looking at how to reorganise proteins in the lens so that they can stay transparent and function properly. And perhaps if that pays off one day, we will be able to prevent cataracts. But at this stage, the next holy grail would probably be to have an intraocular lens that's adjustable as well as completely mimics the young flexible lens that we, we have in our 20s, as well as the ability to adjust for different distances. We have more and more intraocular lens options coming out each year, and I certainly feel really lucky to have access to many of these in Australia.
Just to finish off, I'd like to remind everyone here that 6 6 or 2020 vision is considered the normal vision of a healthy 80 year old eye. I think one important take home message from likely all of the presentations today will be don't accept declining vision as a normal part of aging. Many conditions can be prevented or treatment uh, or treated and I'm certainly grateful to be able to be a part of that. Thank you very much for your attention today. Thanks, Jackie. That was really just such an eloquent and, and um, interesting presentation. And I'm sure we're going to have a, a raft of questions coming after that. So thanks so much. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to move across to, to my presentation. Um, so as per the introduction, I'm one of the deputy directors at the Centre for Eye Research Australia. And amongst other things, it's my great privilege to be involved in a program called Keep Sight. Uh, which is a national program to protect the vision of every Australian with diabetes. So diabetes um, is, as you know, a very, very common condition. We know that about 1.7 million Australians live with diabetes at the moment. About 1.3 million have diagnosed diabetes and the remainder are, are yet to be diagnosed. Um, and of course, Eye disease is one of the most common complications of diabetes. It affects about one in three um, people with diabetes uh, at any time. And we know that as time moves on that, that most people with diabetes will get some degree of diabetic retinopathy. At the moment, we estimate that about 100,000 Australians have sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy. I, I find it's always quite hard to, to picture that, but you could think of a, a near-capacity crowd at the MCG um, to, to put that into perspective. Um, most commonly, diabetic retinopathy involves changes to the delicate blood vessels uh, in the retina at the back of the eye over time, and that can lead to leakage of fluid from the, those blood vessels as well as bleeding. As part of that process, there are blockage of the very tiny blood vessels, uh, which leads to the growth of abnormal blood vessels, which themselves are prone to bleeding and scarring. The important um, thing to note is that the vast majority of vision loss and blindness from diabetes is avoidable uh, or preventable with early detection and timely treatment, and of course, uh, with optimal control of um, the diabetes. So that's a really positive and important message that we can prevent the vast majority of vision loss and blindness from this condition. So one of the keys to that is um, early detection of the disease before it's advanced. And that's important to note because the disease can progress to very advanced stages before symptoms occur. So everyone with diabetes needs to undergo regular screening. And the general recommendation is that that should happen every two years at least, and, and some people uh, annually if they're at higher risk. Um, but there are, of course, some barriers to um, the uptake of that. And we know in Australia that only about half of all people with diagnosed diabetes are getting their eyes checked at the recommended frequency. So let's think about why that may be. So the first problem is that someone with diabetes needs to uh, know about the risk of eye disease and they need to go and seek out an eye check. Um, that is commonly um, prompted by the general practitioner when they go for their diabetes checkup, but it still requires um, the, the person with diabetes to go and make an appointment with their optometrist. Most uh, eye checks for diabetes are done by optometrists. There are fortunately um, Medicare item numbers, which means that that can be done without out-of-pocket expense, but it still requires uh, that, that attendance at the optometrist. A key part of that examination is, is a photograph of the retina at the back of the eye and an analysis of that, uh, that image. Um, we know that um, if someone is detected with diabetic eye disease, they then go on a, a path to treatment, which may include uh, regular injections into the eye or laser treatment and occasionally um, surgery to deal with the more advanced complications. If someone is found uh, not to have treatable diabetic eye disease, then usually they're invited to come back to see their optometrist or referred to an ophthalmologist for, um, for more intensive review. In the absence of diabetic eye disease, that person will need to come back in about two years time. 
Now, one of the, the huge challenges of diabetes is that it's a multi-organ disease. Uh, so there um, are many, many appointments um, to juggle um, mm -hmm. and it's estimated that each day, sorry, I'll just return to that slide. It's estimated that each day uh, a person with diabetes has to make up to 180 different decisions related to their diabetes. So you can imagine that if you've got an appointment in two years time for your eyes, it's pretty easy for that to, um, to sort of fall off the priority list as you're juggling all these other important issues. Uh, and so um, that has resulted in this situation where only about half of Australians with diabetes are getting their eyes checked regularly enough. Now, I had the fortune of working in the UK and seeing how well um, the problem of diabetic retinopathy is dealt with there. Uh, in 2003, England and Wales introduced a national approach to screening for diabetic eye disease. And within a decade, diabetes was no longer the leading cause of blindness registrations uh, for adults. Um, and that's the first time in 50 years since records were kept that diabetes uh, fell from the leading cause of um, blindness mm -hmm. registrations for that group. Uh, sadly, it remains the leading cause uh, in Australia for working age adults. Uh, and so I think that program really showed us that you can have this transformative impact if you help people um, to ensure that they get their eyes checked. So when I returned um, from working in the UK, um, I was struck by the severity of the eye disease that I was seeing from diabetes in our public hospital clinics, uh, really seeing people presenting with advanced, almost end-stage disease. Uh, and unfortunately, in many cases, that was um, people's first eye check. Um, so, you know, we should be able to do a lot better in Australia. We have this world-class eye healthcare workforce, and we've seen uh, two exemplars of that today with Robin and, and Jackie. Um, we have um, government-funded eye examinations for people with diabetes, meaning that most people uh, don't need to pay anything out of pocket. Um, we have this remarkable resource known as the National Diabetes Services Scheme database. Now, that's a national database which is designed to provide uh, low-cost consumables for people with diabetes and as a result of that we've got this registry um, with uh, 90 to 92 percent of all people with diagnosed diabetes in Australia so we know how to get in touch with people with diabetes in this country. We also have the government that's been really committed to um, investing in digital health and innovation. And we have probably the best access to state-of-the-art treatments anywhere in the world. So, you know, diabetic eye disease and, and, and blindness from that should be a thing of the past. But unfortunately, it's not. We, we mentioned that sort of one in two people getting enough eye checks. And that's because there's been fragmentation in all of these um, parts of, of the system. So um, soon after getting back to Australia in, in 2013, uh, I met with Greg Johnson, the CEO of Diabetes Australia, who's shown uh, in the bottom um, left. Um, and Greg was, was really um, tremendously supportive of the idea of doing better uh, for Australians with diabetes. And we quickly formed a partnership across all sectors of eye health uh, in Australia and, and some key people in that uh, journey with Judith Abbott from Vision 2020 Australia, Peter Larson from Specsavers, Kate Taylor from Oculo, a, a digital uh, patient management um, system, uh, and Taryn Black, also of Diabetes Australia. And we, we proposed uh, a solution to government uh, and we were delighted that uh, the Minister, Greg Hunt, was, was very supportive of this initiative. Specsavers committed um, $5 million, so a million dollars a year for five years, and the Australian government has been matching that contribution. We've also had other contributions from the industry. And so we set up um, KeepSight with the goal of trying to reach the 630,000 people uh, in Australia with diabetes who are missing out on regular eye checks. And we would do that by um, engaging with them, encouraging them to book an eye check with a local eye care provider of their choice. Um, and when they do um, make that appointment, they have the opportunity to sign up with KeepSight. And what that does is provides an independent reminder when the next eye check is due. So it's quite a simple system. The objective is to remind people to prevent them from falling between the cracks. Importantly, the system is run by Diabetes Australia. That is the um, organisation that represents um, Australians with diabetes. It's independent of any 
uh, commercial interests and so it's a, a trusted voice. Uh, and so the person with diabetes is registered to, to Heapside and they get these uh, regular reminders when their next eye check is due um, and, and that prevents them from falling between the cracks. So what's the value proposition? Well, most importantly for people with diabetes, it's this welcome reminder from the trusted authority that is Diabetes Australia. Uh, for our eye care providers, it means that people with diabetes are more likely to participate in eye examinations and it provides a safeguard uh, for those eye care providers. Um, at the health system level, it will allow us for the first time to identify those people with diabetes who are not currently engaged in eye care and will enable us to focus um, efforts on the people who are missing out with um, targeted communication and really understanding what will uh, enable access to a regular eye checks. Uh, we um, started on this program about two years ago now, almost exactly actually, um, and we did uh, a lot of advertising campaigns, uh, attendance at, at conferences, just getting the word out there. And so here are some examples of some of the advertising that we did. Um, but we, we very quickly shifted to um, patient-focused communications or communications focused to people with diabetes via SMS and email. Um, and we are now, um, now two years into the program and fortunately have, have experienced some, some early great successes. I guess it's important to think about how we're going to measure if this program has been successful. Um, some of the metrics of that are um, the numbers of people that are enrolling with KeepSight, looking at um, where they reside, um, the age and, and cultural demographics and so on. Importantly, we're looking at the number of people who are returning for their eye checks because that, of course, is the, um, the big objective. And then in the long term, we want to see if we're getting an impact on vision outcomes for people with diabetes um, because our, our overall goal is to save sight from, from diabetes. So here's a, a bit of a graph um, showing our early stages of the program. Initially, as we uh, rolled out, there were registrations, um, self-registrations that people could enrol via the KeepSight website. Uh, and it was about a mixture of, of um, half and half between um, professional registration, so people uh, attended their optometrist and they would register them or uh, they could register themselves. But you can see there was a very steep rise uh, about um, six months or so into the program uh, in registration numbers. And that was when we integrated um, the KeepSight enrolment into the electronic medical record of Specsavers that the major optometry provider chain. And you can see just how um, that um, really dramatically increased our registrations. And so one of our early learnings was we need to make it as easy as possible for our eye health care providers to communicate with their patients about KeepSight and to sign them up to the program. Um, we are, are now at a stage that we've achieved 160,000 uh, people uh, with diabetes in Australia registered to keep site. So that's a tremendous achievement within the space of two years. We are noting um, that each week we have four to 6,000 new Australians with diabetes registering to the program. And already we've sent reminders to 40,000 people that their next eye check is due. So um, we're really pleased with that, um, that traction that we've had. Obviously a long way to go with, with um, 1.3 million Australians with diagnosed diabetes, but we're well on the road. Um, and we are um, now really focusing on integrating the program with electronic patient management systems across every optometry provider. So Luxottica, uh, all of the OPSM stores across Australia have come on board and will be integrating um, keep sight with their electronic patient management system. So we're, we're making great strides there, but we plan to make this available to every single optometry practice uh, across the nation. Um, we are planning to um, begin um, focusing our communications on the people who are missing out. Uh, we, we will, for the first time, be able to identify people who are, are missing out on those eye checks and we'll be able to send targeted reminders and assistance to support their access to eye checks.
Um, this is obviously going to provide tremendous insights into the burden of diabetic eye disease in Australia, unlike we've ever had before. And this will be important to guide treatment access and to measure the effectiveness of care at a national level. Of course, our goal is to make avoidable vision loss and blindness from diabetes a thing of the past. So um, that uh, ends my presentation and, and no doubt we'll have some questions arising from that. Um, I will now um, introduce you to our fundraising specialist, um, Bronwyn Sugden. Um, Bronwyn uh, will be talking to us briefly today about our upcoming tax appeal on age-related macular degeneration. And, and many of you would have had the great pleasure of speaking with Bronwyn uh, if you've donated uh, recently. So thanks, Bronwyn, welcome. Thanks so much, Peter. And thank you to everyone who's joined us online today. It's, it's just lovely to see how many people are, are out there. I wish I could say to you that we no longer need fundraising at CIRA, but as you would have gathered from our previous three speakers, research takes time, it takes patience, and it takes a lot of support. And support financially is always gratefully received at CIRA. But I think what I wanted to say to you today is that what makes CIRA special is that that support goes both ways. We're really interested in learning what's important to you, what you want to know, what you're interested in, and how we can share what's going on at CIRA. The best way we do that is still through appeals. And today I'm extra delighted to let you know that we'll be launching our tax appeal around AMD in line with Macular Month. This year's appeal, as Peter said, focuses on age-related macular disease. It features Professor Robin Geimer, who you would have heard speak this morning, and one of her patients, Wynne Murphy. Wynne's a fantastic woman in her early 70s. She has dry AMD, which, of course, there's no cure for, and how she's navigating life and saying yes to everything. If you're not one of our donors and you wouldn't have received this, I'd encourage you to really um, it take some time and read the story, which is online on the serial website. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. There's lots to learn. And uh, as I said, we'd really like to hear from you. We'd like to know what interests you so we can speak to you directly. Um, if you'd like to give me a call, yeah, I can be contacted on 1300 737 757. Or if you'd like to send me an email, you can address it to community at sierra.org.au. Really look forward to hearing from you. And thanks so much for having me today. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Bron. Um, of course, we wouldn't be able to complete um, the site-saving research we do at CIRA without the generous support of our donor community, and we're tremendously grateful of that support. Now, we've been receiving some great questions, and we've got about 10 minutes to get through some of those. Um, again, apologies if we can't address them all, but let's make a start. So I've got a question uh, for you, Robin, for, to, to start off with. And, and, and this, uh, I guess, is a question that's come from a number of people. Um, they've asked the same sorts of questions, Robin, Deborah and Rita, for example. Uh, and that question is, what is worse, uh, wet or dry AMD? Thanks, Peter. So the natural history of the disease, the wet one is far worse because uh, it's much quicker and the scarring that occurs is much more devastating to central vision than, than the dry or geographic atrophy. That goes slowly. People adapt to it. It's a very slow, progressive thing uh, and does not happen sort of overnight like the wet. So without any treatment, then much better to have dry than wet. With treatment, of course, there is a treatment for, for wet for which there isn't for dry at the moment. Unfortunately, however, the wet treatment does not actually cure the disease. And what we're finding and what I mentioned uh, in my talk is that even though the treatments have revolutionised the outcome dramatically, completely miraculously, there still is some vision loss down the track as those patients that you've saved from getting the scar start to get the dry macular degeneration because the cells are just not healthy. So um, uh, still better not to get the wet. Uh, uh, however, there is treatment for that, um, but that doesn't save you from the dry. So if we could stop either, that would be better. 
Thanks, Thanks Robin. Uh, I guess a, a related question that we received from Benita is, is it possible to transfer healthy cells from one part of the macula to the part that's damaged? Um, and then a, a second part to that question is, can you uh, vacuum or remove the drusen uh, when AMD is first picked up? Or is it possible to suppress the immune system from attacking the eye or the drusen? Mm -hmm. So the answer to the first question there was uh, maybe a couple of a decade or so ago, uh, a surgical treatment where they would transpose the retina. So it was sort of like uh, dressmaking where you put a pleat in the retina. So you would detach the retina and try and swing it around to get a bit of the peripheral retina in the middle. It had horrific complications and, uh, and actually, the central retina is uh, designed for fine vision and the peripheral retina isn't. So even if you could get some peripheral retina and put it in the middle, it wouldn't work to the same extent as your central retina. But I guess the, the real answer to that question is stem cells is trying to replace not necessarily with your own cells, but potentially you could take your, a skin biopsy and grow that up, make those skin cells um, retinal pigment epithelial cells that would then go in as a healthy, uh, per perhaps a, a renewed layer of cells, or you could get them from somebody else. So that's that cell therapy uh, arm of treatment. Um, and then all, all that I talked about in trying to dampen down the inflammation was that, that question about could we suppress the immune system? That is what that is trying to do. That's trying to adjust in the eye, so you don't want to really dampen down your immune system everywhere. Um, but if you could just uh, direct it to your eye, then that is the, the whole purpose of those complement-based uh, treatments of which you saw there was a flurry of them now. So, yes, everyone's thinking along those lines. And then to remove the drusen, that is actually what the, the laser is trying to do. So the drusen are not the problem. The drusen are just a marker that there's a problem. So the drusen in and of themselves aren't necessarily um, something that you have to remove, but if you could make the cells that should be removing that debris more healthy, the retinal pigment epithelium, then that's the aim. And so the laser is aiming to rejuvenate that layer to clear the debris, not only that you see in, in, in the drusen, but actually more importantly in a membrane underneath called Brooks membrane. So yes, whoever asks those questions is on the right, the right uh, track and uh, any help you could give us, uh, we'd be most grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. And um, just to follow on with the, the cell transplantation work, it, it, it is a major focus for research at CIRA, uh, one of the sort of major pillars um, for vision regeneration. And, and uh, Dr. Raymond Wong is working really hard with his team to, to not only develop um, stem-like stem cells that can um, differentiate into retinal pigment cells, but also to turn uh, resident cells in the retina supporting cells into the light detecting cells when those are damaged and lost in a range of conditions. So it's a really hot area of research and, and very promising for the future. We've now got uh, a couple of questions for you, Jackie. Um, a great one from Mary is, um, does cataract surgery last forever or will it come back? That is a great question, Mary. Thanks, Peter. Um, cataracts do not come back. Uh, so the really good thing is once you've had cataract surgery, you do not need to have it again. There is something called after cataract or posterior capsular opacification, which can cause some of the symptoms to come back, but it's not exactly the cataract. So what happens then is that sometimes behind the intraocular lens that we put in the eye, the natural bag um, that belongs to you is part of your body can haze over slightly. That happens in around about um, 10 to 20% of people who have cataract surgery, and it can make vision become blurry again. But if that occurs, uh, it's very easy to treat just in the rooms with a minor procedure, which is done by laser. So it's not technically the cataract coming back, but it is something to know about. Fantastic. Um, and Jackie, while we've got you there, um, Cheryl has asked, can contact lenses be used to help eyes with cataracts? So to some extent, Cheryl, the, the thing is glasses and contact lenses, they help with the focus of the eye, but they're not going to take away the problem, which is the yellowiness or uh, loss of vision that's associated with cataract. 
So if you're looking through glasses or a contact lens, you still have to look through that yellow or brownie coloured cataract to get your vision. So sometimes in the early stages when the cataract's changing the focus of your eye, wearing glasses or contact lenses can help, but they're not going to cure the, the problem, which is the cataract. Great. Thanks, Jackie. So I've got a question here from Tom um, relating to diabetes. Um, and, and the question is, is it, given, uh, is it a given that you'll have some issues with your eyes if you have um, type 1 diabetes? Um, and so for members of the audience who aren't familiar, there are, there are two major um, subtypes of, of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Um, and type 1 tends to be where you can't produce enough of the insulin um, that, um, that controls the sugar levels, whereas type 2 is more of a, a situation of resistance to insulin. Um, but most people with type 1 diabetes will eventually get some degree of diabetic retinopathy. The important word there is, is time. Um, diabetes um, doesn't affect the eyes overnight. It's a very gradual series of changes. Um, and the onset of type 1 diabetes is usually quite... Um, quite easy to note and so um, there's a there's a long lead time between your diagnosis of type 1 diabetes usually and the onset of diabetic retinopathy the ways that you can um, minimize the chance of progressing to sight threatening retinopathy of course is is having good control of the risk factors for, for retinopathy and number one is is control of the blood sugar but of course um, controlling blood pressure and cholesterol um, are also very important. And the second thing is to have those regular eye checks. And the vast majority of people can enjoy um, good vision uh, in the long term if, if they um, follow that advice. I've got another question um, from Jeannie in relation to diabetes, and that is, can you reverse eye disease caused by diabetes with lifestyle? Um, I know that um, type 2 diabetes can in some cases be reversed with diet and exercise, and that's correct. So um, in some cases, um, people with type 2 diabetes can uh, minimise um, the disease and, and occasionally turn the disease around by uh, lifestyle interventions, um, diet, exercise and weight loss. Uh, but many people with type 2 diabetes um, you know, can, can certainly go a long way to improving their diabetes, but not necessarily reverse it. Once eye disease has developed, um, that um, can be slowed with a gradual lowering of the um, blood sugar levels and improvement in the control of the disease. Um, there is one caveat, though, that um, sudden dramatic changes in the control of the blood sugar, uh, particularly if that blood sugar has been and elevated for a long, long period of time um, can actually lead to short-term worsening of the um, diabetic retinopathy, the, the eye disease. And so it's always important if you have diabetes and your sugar levels have been higher than they should be for a, for a long period of time, then um, the lowering of that sugar needs to be done in very careful consultation with your diabetes specialist and your eye doctor. So probably a long-winded way of saying, yes, diet and exercise are generally um, good to get control of your diabetes in type 2 uh, and uh, improving uh, those parameters can slow the progression of diabetic eye disease, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't still have your eyes checked. Um, I will see if there are any others. We, we're approaching the end of the um, time that we have uh, today. Um, Morgan, did we have any others? I think we've got one other, and that is um, probably a general question that I can put to both um, Jackie and Robin and probably a great way to, um, to wind up, and that is um, around the theme of what lifestyle changes can we make uh, to have healthy eyes as we age? You want to go first, Jackie? Um, sure. Well, some of, some of the things um, we've touched on slightly, but protecting your eyes from UV light with sunglasses, especially in a climate such as um, Australia, is very important. Um, stopping smoking is a really big beneficial difference um, that, that people who do smoke can make. And then uh, we come to di um, diet um, and lifestyle and um, there, there is a lot of interest and a lot of different research 
in in terms of the best dietary modifications to make for your eyes. Um, in terms of eye health in general, I usually recommend um, a um, healthy diet high in vegetables, particularly the coloured things like carrots and pumpkins. As, as we all know, carrots are good for your eyes. Green leafy things like spinach, um, just to make sure that um, we have a, a varied and healthy diet diet is extremely important. Well, I would agree with that entirely. And I just add, um, you know, just a sensible approach is a, a balanced, uh, healthy diet. And, and of course, exercise seems to be more and more important, particularly as you get older uh, and, and keeping a good weight. So they're just general lifestyle advice for, for all uh, diseases uh, as you get older. So I think that's a sensible approach. Fantastic. And, and I think we've heard as well that, um, that we should not accept vision loss as we age. Jackie made a really good point about that. So, you know, early presentation to your doctor or your optometrist for an eye check, if you notice your vision changing, um, please don't just accept that as a normal part of ageing. Uh, so that was the last question for today in, in what I think has been a great online forum. Uh, could you please join me in a virtual round of applause for Professor Robin Geimer and Dr Jackie Belts? Uh, really, we've been delighted by your presentations and um, the fact that you've so generously shared your expertise today. Thank you all once again for joining us for our Healthy Ageing Eyes Community Forum and we hope to be able to see you all at a CIRA event in the not too distant future. Thank you. And thanks to you too, Peter. Thank you.